Hey everybody, this is Rust from Metro Game Core. I have another review for you here today, and yes, this is another Ambernick device. Now, these guys release a new one about every month or so, and so this is just another in a long line of retro handhelds that are available from this company. And this one here is called the RG353PS. Now, that's alphabet soup, obviously, but there is a rhyme to their reason, and so we're actually going to cover that in the next section, where I'm going to break out what each of those numbers and letters mean, just so you can kind of get an idea if you are looking at different models from this company. Company. Either way, this device here is actually one I'm already familiar with because they released a very similar one last year called the RG353P. And both of these have the exact same shape and chip inside. The only major difference is that this one here is more budget minded. The previous model had a dual boot function into both Android and Linux, whereas this one is going to be Linux only. And I'll tell you a secret, on these devices, you really just want to stick with Linux anyway. And the nice thing is with this budget model, they are going to cut the price by quite a bit. The original was about $135. This one's going to be under 100. I think it'll even be under 90 for the initial like 48 hour pre-order period. Regardless, if you're in the market for a new retro handheld under $100, I think that the price to performance and overall comfort of this device might make it worth your consideration. And so without any further delay, let's jump into the review. Okay, let's get started with a quick lesson in naming convention from Ambernick. And we're going to use today's device as our example, RG353PS. Now the RG just stands for Retro Game. It's been the same way for about four years at this point. And the next series is going to be two numbers that indicate the screen size. And so in the case of this device, we have a 3.5 inch screen. But with other devices like the RG552, that's going to be a 5.5 inch screen. And same thing with the RG405M, which as you can guess is 4 inches. Now the final number is going to be the chipset, and this is basically in a generational form. So the old school devices like the RG350 or the 280V, all those use that same chipset which was the JZ4770. And then throughout 2021 we saw a bunch of devices coming out with the RK3326 chipset. Now there was only one device released with the 2 generation, that was the RG552. Turns out this chipset ran really hot and just really wasn't worth it. And then of course today's device is using the RK3566. And so that's why we have the number three right here. Now the number four is considered unlucky in China, so they skipped that generation and went straight to five. And that's the T618 chipset that we find in devices like the RG405M. And then finally, there are some devices that will have an X at the end of it, like the RG35XX. And that generally means that they don't know how to categorize it within their own naming convention. And then finally, at the end, you may see some letters or none. And this can fit all sorts of different patterns, but generally what it'll mean is that if there's a P, it's going to be a plastic model, and M is metal, and V is vertical. Now recently, they've been adding an S to the end of some of theirs, and that means it's supposed to be a light or a budget version. And then of course, again, sometimes they just throw an X on there because they don't know what else to do. Anyway, that's really about it when it comes to the naming convention, I expect this will probably change at some point. But at least for now, once you know the name of the device, you can kind of guess at what kind of performance and price you're going to be looking at. So now let's go ahead and go over the specs of the RG353PS. Like I mentioned, this one has the RK3566 chipset, and we haven't gotten confirmation about the amount of RAM, but my guess here is it's going to be one gigabyte like the other models within the same range. Now the original 353P had internal storage for the Android build, but because this one isn't going to have it, I expect it won't have any internal storage either. Instead, the operating system and all the games are going to be hosted on SD cards. In terms of display, we're looking at three and a half inches with a 640 by 480 resolution, very similar to most of the other devices within this line from Ambernick. And the battery is the same size as the previous model, 3500 milliamp hours, which should give you between five and six hours of gameplay. In terms of connectivity, this one has built-in 5 GHz Wi-Fi as well as Bluetooth 4.2. And it also features an HDMI port, which means that you can basically consoleize this by plugging it into a TV and then connecting it to a Bluetooth controller. In terms of operating system, we have the stock Linux firmware that will come with it, but because this chipset has been actively developed by the community, there's actually four other custom firmware options that we have from day one. And we'll talk about those choices later in the video. And finally, there are three different color options that we've seen in Ambernick videos. We have the retro gray one that I'll be showing off here today, but then they also have two different transparent models. One is called transparent white and the other is purple. And I think we'll be able to see more of these once they actually have a sales page up and available. Now, if you're brand new to all this stuff, you're probably wondering what systems you'll actually be able to emulate on this device. 
So here's a quick look at some of the major systems that'll work. Now, as you get to the higher end systems like Saturn, Nintendo 64, Dreamcast, and PlayStation Portable, you will run into some games that won't play at full speed. Instead, the way I characterize it is that most of the games on those systems will run on this device, but there will be a minority of them that won't play at full speed. And we'll do some testing later in the video to give you a better idea. Now for all the other systems, PlayStation 1 and below, yeah, all these are going to play just great. But if you're looking for those higher end systems like GameCube and PS2, this device is definitely not capable of those. Okay. Okay, let's move on to the unboxing portion. As you can see, we have the three color options right here. And opening up the box, it's a pretty bare bones experience. Inside the box, we're gonna get a quick start guide, which will show some of the button configurations. And then we have a glass screen protector and then a USB-C charging cable. And that's really about it. So let's go ahead and check out the device itself. Now, first impressions here, I was really impressed by the gray color that they're using. In fact, I would call it more like a tan color. I don't have the original Game Boy DMG here to compare with, but I think this is really similar color. And I really like the gray and red accents right here. It really drives that Game Boy theme home. It's kind of a crazy mix between a Super Nintendo controller, but with a Game Boy design. I especially like the little text here on the bezel, which again reminds me of the Game Boy DMG. I also like the contrast of the red face buttons, but I could have done without the white text within them. Now, one of the unique things about this model is the stack shoulder button. So let's look at the top first. We'll start with the IO, which includes an OTG port here on the left. This will allow you to plug in things like a USB controller. From there, we have a reset button and a mini HDMI port, and then our volume buttons and charging port. So now let's take a look at these shoulders and triggers. And these are the exact same as they were on the RG353P. And honestly, I think they're pretty good. They have a hinge mechanism near the center of the device. And so as you press down on them, they press down towards the edge as opposed to like sliding towards the back. And I think this works really well because of the way that you're actually going to hold the device. If you were to try to just press it near the hinge, it's going to be a little bit harder to push down on. But if you're just naturally cupping the device, it's going to be super easy to press. And I definitely prefer these over the inline shoulder buttons that you find on most Ambernick devices. Now, in terms of these shoulder buttons, they have a similar feel to them. They're a little bit lighter to the touch, and they also stick out a little bit more from the controller than the triggers do. And I think that's a good thing. It makes them easy to differentiate between the two. So in general, in terms of just holding it and ergonomics, I think it's very comfortable. The fact that the controller is so rounded makes it very easy to hold in the hand, and I don't find it to be a far reach from the analog sticks all the way up to the triggers. And so I think no matter what games you play, it'll be relatively comfortable. Now, that being said, I probably wouldn't want to play first person shooters on this because the reach is a little bit more than I would like, but as long as you're not playing games that rely solely on those controls, I think it'll be fine. Speaking of the analog sticks, let's go ahead and check those out next. Now these are using Nintendo Switch Joy-Cons, and even though Ambernick has been using Hall Sensor Magnetic Joysticks lately, these are not them. And I don't think that's a bad thing, because it drives down the cost of the device overall, and for the majority of the time, these sticks are going to be just fine. So really, no complaints here, these are just standard retro handheld analogs. Moving over to the D-pad, this has a rubber membrane connection, much like many other classic consoles. It has a good amount of travel and pivot to it, and at this point, Ambernick has really kind of have perfected their D-pad process. Now, that being said, there are some people who don't like the feel of an Ambernick D-pad. For example, when doing the Contra test, which is when you push down and then rock the D-pad back and forth, ideally you wouldn't want your character to move that much. And the movement that you'll get from an Ambernick D-pad is generally going to be a little bit above average. As you can see right here, my character is moving quite a lot. And the reason why this matters in a game like Contra is that if you try to duck down to avoid a bullet, you might actually do a diagonal instead, which means your character will run directly into the bullet. And so this is why some people will have complaints about the Ambernick D-pad. Now, this is a very specific use case, but it can come through in other games besides Contra. And there are some fixes out there. If you just look up D-pad fix for Ambernick, you should find all sorts of videos and guides too. Anyway, in terms of passing the Contra test, I would say no, this isn't going to pass it. But as I'll show in my other testing, I still think the D-pad is pretty good. When it comes down to it, if you've ever tried an Ambernick device, it's going to be a very similar experience right here. And chances are you already know whether or not you like that feeling. And personally, I'm a fan. Okay, also on the left side, we have a select button as well as a function button. The function button will behave as a hotkey and has a soft dome style switch connection. This means it's going to have a little bit of a clicky feel. Meanwhile, the select button has a rubber membrane connection connection, much like the D-pad. On the right side, we have a similar setup with the start button as well as the power button right here. Now, in my previous review of the other model, I had said that I didn't like the power button located right here, but it turns out that over time, I've never really accidentally pressed it. Now, moving over to the face buttons, these also have a rubber membrane connection, which means they're going to feel like a classic controller like the Super Nintendo GamePad. And these are nice and responsive with a little bit of mush to them as well. Yeah, a really nice classic feel. My main complaint about these buttons is that they just feel too small for this 
this controller. In fact, there have been several times where I wished that maybe they had just taken the entire right analog stick out and then just had more space for larger buttons. If we take a look at something like the original Super Nintendo controller, you can see that these are smaller controllers than the device itself, but have a much bigger button. And so I'm not saying that we need to have full-size Super Nintendo buttons on this device, but man, there should probably be some sort of middle ground between the two. And so if I was the designer at Ambernick for a day, I would lose that right analog stick and put bigger buttons here overall. It'll probably reduce the amount of controls that you have for certain systems, but in the end, when it comes to a classic gaming experience, I think that would have been an improvement. Okay, now let's take a look at the bottom of the device. Starting with the left, we have one of the two stereo speakers, and then we have two micro SD card slots and a headphone jack. And the audio that's coming out of here is okay. I would give it maybe a six or a seven out of 10, but I do appreciate that we at least have stereo sound. Looking at the back, we have a small Ambernick logo and then these two rubber pads right here. And generally these pads usually have two functions. Number one, they're supposed to aid in just the overall grip of the device itself. But I did find on this model, the location of the pads didn't make a lot of sense. My middle fingers will touch the pads when I'm using it, but I've never felt like that added any grip to the overall experience. And the other function here is that it's supposed to help the device stay in place when you lay it down flat. And then finally, we have the screen. Now this has a gray bezel to it, and I know a lot of people may not like this, but I personally do. I think it gives it a very retro vibe, especially with this Game Boy style text here at the bottom. I definitely think it's better than the Ambernick logo that we saw on the previous RD353P that we see here. And other than a couple color changes, I think these two devices are basically identical. The bottom one here is obviously modeled after the US version of the Super Nintendo controller. And while I've got a lot of nostalgia for that controller, I really do like the look of this new one better. And I think it's because it's not trying so hard to actually be an old school Super Nintendo controller. Instead, it's just a mixture of retro nostalgia, and I think it's been done a little bit more tastefully. For example, if we look at the old Super Nintendo style one right here, to me, it just kind of looks a little bit cheap. Like it's trying to be a Super Nintendo controller, but it's obviously not. And so instead, this older version had like a cheap knockoff kind of feel to it. But I think at this point, I'm just being nitpicky about the design. So let's move on to size and weight. To start, I want to compare it against the other horizontal handheld with the same chipset from Ambernick. This is the RG353M. Now this one's got a few upgrades over the one we're testing today. Number one, it has a metal shell to it, which is really nice to feel in the hand. And it also has those hall sensor analog sticks too. Additionally, this one can dual boot into Android and is quite a bit smaller as well. Another horizontal handheld that has the same chipset is the Palkitty RK2023. This one came out about a month ago and is also targeted for that budget demographic. However, it does come with some compromises, which we'll talk about a little bit more near the end of the video. Either way, as you can see, yes, it is quite a bit smaller than the 353P. Now up next, we're gonna move up one chipset generation. So this is the Ambernick RG405M. This one also has a metal shell and hall sensor analog sticks, and it has a larger four inch display. Additionally, this one has a much stronger chipset. So it is going to be able to play a good amount of GameCube and PS2 games too. But in terms of size, you can see the 405M is actually a little bit smaller too. Now, before we move on to comparing other size devices, let's do a quick thickness test. Here you can see that the 353PS is about 22 and a half millimeters thick. By comparison, the 353M is about 16 millimeters, and then the 405M is 16 and a half. So these are not only smaller, but quite a bit thinner too. Some other devices worth comparing in size are going to be the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. This one has the same chipset as the RG405M. This one is a little bit wider than the 353PS, but it also has that widescreen high resolution display as well. And just because I have it on my mind, let's go ahead and do a comparison against the Retroid Pocket Flip. This one again is using the same chipset as the other ones we were just looking at, but it does have a nice clamshell form factor. I'm still working on my review of this device, but it should be out here at the end of this week. Now in terms of weight, we're looking at 211 grams for the 353PS, and that does make it heavier than the RK2023 by quite a bit. However, it is still lighter than the other devices that we compared it against. For example, here's the 353M, as well as the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus and the RG405M. In the end, I do think the RG353PS is a comfortable device to hold and use, but a lot of that comfort comes from the relatively large size compared to its other peers. And that larger size does come with a compromise in the fact that it is a little bit less pocketable than the others. Personally, the way I like to categorize this size is that sure, I can throw it in my pocket when needed. However, this is not a device I would like to have in my pocket while I'm walking around. I think for that case, it's just a little bit too big. And that includes either the front pocket or the back one as well. And so for me, in my opinion, I don't think this is a pocketable device, but of course that's a very subjective thing. And so you might think that this is just fine, 
For me, I would like something a little bit smaller. In the end, in terms of just design and comfort, I really do like the 353 PS. I think it has a very nostalgic hybrid look between the Super Nintendo and Game Boy. And of course, this is only one of three color options. And so if you don't like this one here, you might like the others. Either way, I think that's enough when it comes to the physical device itself. Let's move on to performance and software. And we're gonna start by just booting up the stock SD card that comes in the device. Now, this is a stock firmware that's been around for over a year at this point, so it's very well known. And it's based off of an older version of a custom firmware called Botacera. And the firmware here is very easy to operate. You would essentially just navigate to whatever system you wanna boot up, and then go into the navigation menu and start up the game and you're good to go. As far as the hotkeys and everything else like that, you can find that in the quick menu guide that comes with the device. Now, if you order the cheapest model, it's not gonna come with a second SD card, but if you wanna pay more, you can get a card that'll be loaded up with games. Now, if you don't get one of those cards, it's pretty easy to set up. All you'd have to do is just put a blank card right in here and then power on the device. From there, it's gonna put a bunch of different folders on your card, so then you wanna power down the device, remove that card, and then put it into your computer. From there, you can put all your games into those folders and you should be good to go. Either way, the performance here on the stock firmware is pretty good and I've showed that off in other videos, but what I wanna show you here in this video is that you can use other custom operating systems from day one with this device. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove the stock SD card, and as you can see right here, they're using a pretty high quality card now. This brand right here is an offshoot of Toshiba and it's pretty reliable. Either way, I'm going to grab my old 353P, which has been loaded up with Arc OS, a custom firmware I really like. And the nice thing about these two devices is that the cards are going to be interchangeable. So all I have to do is just put in these two cards here and then boot it up, and yeah, we're right into Arc OS. And as you can see, I've already gone through and loaded up this second card with a bunch of my favorite games. And so essentially I have this all ready to go. Now about a month ago, I actually did a full starter guide video and written guide for Arc OS. And so if you are thinking about picking up one of these devices, I would highly recommend checking out something like Arc OS or one of the other custom firmware options that you have. And of course I go into a lot more detail in my startup guide, but let me show you really quick what the experience can be like once you have it set up. So right here on the front screen, I can navigate through all my systems, very similar to the stock operating system. And then I can press A to go inside of these individual menus. And you can see I have a list of games as well as the box art too. And because I've already set up my network and configuration, you can see that I'm connecting to Retro Achievements and logging in right there. That means I'll be able to earn Retro Achievements as I go through and play some of these older games. And that's a lot of fun. Now, once I'm done playing a game, I can just press select and start and it'll close out. And as I'm closing out of the game, I have it set up to automatically save my game when I do that. Now, if I go back into the menu and then start up that same game, you can see here it's going to automatically load exactly where I was before. So that's a really handy setup right here within Arc OS. In addition, the sleep mode in Arc OS works great. So I can just tap on the power button like this and the device will go right to sleep. It'll still drain the battery a little bit when you keep it on sleep like this. So I wouldn't do this for days on end, but if you just want to close it down for a little bit, you can totally do that. And to wake it up, you would just tap on the power button again. And Arc OS has a bunch of nice bells and whistles too. For example, you have a variety of different themes to pick from if you want to change up the look and feel of your device. And it also comes with a special app called Theme Master, which will allow you to download even more themes. On top of that Arc OS is supported by over-the-air updates so you can just update it via Wi-Fi and this firmware has been optimized to give you the best performance possible and so now I think it's a good time to move over to our emulation testing and for this I am going to use Arc OS so that we can see exactly how good a performance you can get using custom firmware so we're going to start with the easier to play systems and move our way up from there starting with Game Boy as you can see here everything is going to work great and I think it's a nice mix between this Game Boy bezel as well as the overall colorization and so yeah I think when it comes to playing Game Boy Game Boy Color this is going to be a great experience now when it comes to Game Boy Advance, this one has a wider aspect ratio, and so because of that you will get some black bars at the top and bottom, but honestly I don't think it's that bad on a 4x3 display like this. When it comes to actually playing Game Boy Advance games, these are all going to run just fine. In fact, the screen on this device is really good. It has some very nice color balance, and additionally within Arc OS you can adjust the saturation too. So I have bumped up the saturation a little bit here in the menu, and I think it looks really good. And again, if you want to learn how to do any of this stuff, you can check out my Arc OS guide to learn more. Moving forward to home console systems, here's the NES, and as expected, this one plays great too. And of course, same thing with Super Nintendo. Now, something I always like to show with these 480p displays is that if you blow it up to the full screen 4x3, you can see that the pixels are not going to be 100% balanced. The Mega Man X life bar is a perfect example. Now, honestly, I think the easiest fix for this is actually just use a shader to cover all this up. So we can go into the Arc OS quick menu right here, then go into shaders and load. 
And from there, we can go into the shaders folder and then the interpolation subfolder. And then within there, I think the easiest shader to grab is the one called Pixelate. After you've selected that one, you can look again here close up with the Mega Man X life bar. And yes, it looks balanced now. It's going to make the image just a little bit less sharp than before, but honestly, I still think it looks very great on the screen. And so when it comes to playing like NES or Super Nintendo games, that's usually what I will do to balance out the pixels. And I think of all the systems that I play on this device, Super Nintendo is one of the best overall. And it's probably something like 50% functional just because it's a very comfortable controller. And then the other 50% is just straight up nostalgia because I love using this controller overall. Either way, if you're looking to have one of the best Super Nintendo experiences under $100, I don't think you're going to find anything better than this. Okay, moving on, here's Sega Genesis, and this one also works great, and same thing with Sega CD. So basically any of those 16-bit and even 32-bit home consoles are going to play great. Same thing with arcade games, you can play all the 80s and 90s classics right here. And for these, I prefer to use the analog stick, it just feels a little bit more natural. Same thing with PlayStation 1, no matter what game you throw at it, it's going to play at full speed, and it's going to look great here as well. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the systems that will have a somewhat compromised experience. We'll start with Nintendo DS. Now from a performance standpoint, DS is going to play just fine. However, you will have to press the shoulder buttons to tab between the two different screens at once. And additionally, this screen is not touchscreen, so you won't be able to tap on anything within the menus. Instead, you'll have to focus on games from the DS catalog that were controller friendly. And additionally, I would choose games that only really focus on one screen at a time. So as long as you're okay with those concessions, then yes, you can play Nintendo DS on this device as well. Moving up from there, let's try out Sega Saturn. This is using the standalone Yabasan Shiro Core. And for the most part, many of these games are going to play pretty well. Now, I wouldn't go as far as saying that every single Saturn game is going to play at full speed. In fact, many of them will be using a frame skip in order to achieve something that's very close. And so it's really going to come down to your expectations when it comes to playing Sega Saturn. If you're like me and you just get a thrill out of playing Sega Saturn games in the first place, because this was a console I never had growing up, then yes, I think you'll have a pretty good time just being able to play these games in the first place. However, if you're looking for a recreation of the original Saturn console, this is not going to be it. If you want something closer to perfect Sega Saturn gameplay, you will definitely need a stronger chipset than this one. And it's also going to be a similar experience with Sega Dreamcast. This one will run with a frame skip as well, so you're not going to get a crisp 60 frames per second the entire time. However, most of the games that you try will be playable. Even something like Blue Stinger, which is a little bit hard to emulate, is still running at full speed. And a lot of that has to do with optimizations within ArcOS, but all the same, I have a really great time playing a Sega Dreamcast on this device. It's not going to play every single game, but most of them will. Up next, we have PlayStation Portable, and I think among all the other higher-end systems that run on this device, this one's going to be the most hit and miss. There will be many games that will run at 60 frames per second absolutely fine, like Soul Calibur Broken Destiny. But there are many others where you're going to have to use some sort of hack. For example, with Grand Theft Auto Liberty City Stories, as well as Sonic Rivals, you will have to do frame skip. In the end, if you are looking at getting a really good PlayStation Portable experience, I would not recommend this device in particular. For that, I would recommend upgrading to something like the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus or the Ambernick RG405M. Now, another benefit of using custom firmware like ArcOS over the stock firmware is that you can use an app called Portmaster. This will allow you to set up PC ports of some of your favorite games. And I've done many videos and guides about Portmaster and the different games that you can play. And I think you'd be surprised to look at the Portmaster list and see all the different games that you could try out on this device. So again, if you want to learn more, I would recommend checking out my ArcOS guide because there are some really nice gems within here. And finally, in my testing, I did want to check out the HDMI function. Within the menus, it looks to be providing a 720p input signal. And yeah, it looks really great here. And the nice thing is, again, with using ArcOS, is that it'll scale all of these games correctly. So 4x3 games like NES will play in 4x3 on a big screen TV. But then if you play something wider screen like the PSP, it's going to play in 16x9. And so it is nice to be able to just kind of have a plug and play experience where you can just hook up the HDMI cable and start playing right then and there. And it's funny, but once I got to my HDMI testing, I realized I had forgotten to test Nintendo 64. So let's do that within HDMI. And I would say performance here is very similar to what you will find on something like Sega Dreamcast. For the most part, most games will play at full speed, like Diddy Kong Racing. Personally, I like to use the Glide 64 Mark II standalone emulator, which you can set up within the ArcOS settings. 
And like with Dreamcast, it's not going to play every single game at full speed, but many of these games are still going to be relatively playable. Even something like GoldenEye 007 seems to be running fairly well here in the first level. At the end of the day, yes, I think HDMI works great on this device, and yeah, Nintendo 64 is pretty good too. Okay, and so with my testing out of the way, let's go ahead and start wrapping things up and talk about what I like and what I don't like about the RG 353PS. Number one, like me, I think a lot of people are drawn to the Super Nintendo form factor, but I also really like the DMG color styling as well. I think they really kind of nailed it with this color scheme. Additionally, by virtue of being a little bit larger of a device and having that rounded kind of shape to it, it is very comfortable to hold. And so if you are worried about getting one of those smaller handhelds and having that kind of cramped feeling, I don't think you're going to get it here on this one. Another Another thing that really kind of set apart this device from the other ones that are under $100 is that it has a very high quality to it. All the buttons feel nice, the screen is good, the Wi-Fi works well, I think everything just kind of comes together. And I also think that at around $90, I think we're getting a good amount of price to performance. The ability to play most of those games from the Nintendo 64 and Dreamcast era is pretty awesome. And the other nice thing here is that this device can take advantage of all the other community work over the past year or so. And so in addition to ArcOS working from day one, you'll be able to have the same experience with other firmwares like Jealous, Unofficial OS, as well as the Retro Arena. Now, of course, there's no such thing as a perfect device, and this one here is no exception. So let's talk about some of the things I don't like about the 353PS. Number one, I think the buttons on this device are just too small. Even though these buttons are the same size as many other handhelds, we have a lot more space to work with. And so because of that, it does feel like a wasted opportunity. Additionally, this is one of many devices that have been released by Ambernic over the past year or so. And so because of that, we have so many different choices at different price points. And so even though this is a pretty good device, this may not be the right one for you just because there are so many other options out there. And finally, if you're one of those who consider themselves to be a retro handheld gaming enthusiast, you're not going to find anything new within the 353PS. Other than the lower price and different color options, there's really not a lot going on here if you're really kind of plugged into the scene. And so if you already have a 353P or you've already passed on one, there may be no reason for you to even be interested in this one here. However, if you are in the market for something that's under $100 with pretty good performance for the price, then I I do think the 353PS is a pretty good deal. However, like I mentioned before, there's a ton of different choices right here. So let's talk about a few of these and why this one may or may not be the best fit for you. Number one, if you're looking for the absolute best performance at the lowest price, then I think the Pow Kitty RK2023 might be a better fit. Now we don't know the final price of the 353PS, but I'm just going to guess that it's going to be $90. That means you'll be able to save $15 by getting the RK2023. However, as you may have seen in my full review of this device, there are some concessions. Number one, this device does not come with Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, and the D-pad and face buttons are not very comfortable either. So yes, you can get the RK2023 for a lower price, but you will also get a worse experience overall. Now, if you want something with a little bit higher quality, I would recommend the RG353M. This one can boot into Android and has a nice premium metal shell as well. Not only that, it's insanely pocketable and thin, which makes it really fun to carry around. However, as you've probably noticed, the price difference between the two is significant, and I'm not really sure this is going to be worth that $55 upgrade price. Now, if you want better performance than the 353PS, you will have to pay more. For example, the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus is about $150 before shipping, but this one has a much more powerful chipset and will be able to play a lot of good GameCube and PS2 games, and even a few Nintendo Switch games as well. And it's going to be a similar story with the Retroid Pocket Flip. This one starts at $160 and has the same performance as the Retro Pocket 3 Plus, but it also has this really nice and portable clamshell form factor too. And like I mentioned, I'm working on my final review of this one, but I got to admit that I just can't stop playing this one. I really enjoy it. And then finally, if you want to stay within the Ambernic ecosystem, there's the RG405M. This one's quite a bit more expensive, it's about double the price of the other, but you are getting some really nice premium features, including a metal shell and a larger screen, and you're going to get that higher performance at a much smaller form factor too. At the end of the day, we have a bounty of options when it comes to retro handhelds in 2023. And while the new RG353PS is very similar to other products that Ambernic has released before, I do think there is a good target audience for this as well. If you're looking for a nice horizontal handheld with good components and a nice screen, then I think the quality of the RG353PS is unmatched in this price point. Now, of course, you could get something for cheaper and get a lower quality experience, and you can get something better if you pay more money as well. However, I think there are some people who will find this device to be in that perfect Goldilocks range for them. And honestly, if we take a step back from the whole comparison thing and price points and all that other stuff, 
I think it's pretty amazing that in this day and age, for less than $100, we have something that can play thousands of games in a very nice form factor. Is this the absolute best device that you can buy right now? Probably not. There's so many different options out there that the best means different things to different people. But all the same, in a vacuum, I think that the 353PS is a very excellent device. If anything, the only thing I would change about the 353PS is that I wish they had made a plastic version of the 353M. Because honestly, I think that having something that small but plastic and cheaper would have been an amazing experience. And I should also mention that if you're in the market for a vertical handheld, then I think there's other options out there too. For example, there's the RG353V, and this one also has a budget version available too. And if you get the budget version, it comes in at just under $100 right now. In fact, I just recently picked one of these up and I'm going to do a video about how I think this one is the best vertical handheld you can get for under 100 bucks. So be on the lookout for that video in the coming weeks as well. Either way, I think I've made my point in the fact that the RG353PS really is nothing new. But all the same, it's an excellent combination of quality, performance, and price. And so for this reason and many others, yes, I do recommend the 353PS if you are in the market and you think it's going to be a good fit for you. But I'd also love to hear what you think about this device in the comments below. As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.